anybody can be, panelists can be, uh, join, yeah, other people can be joining us, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. Hi, Maddie, welcome. Hello. Hi, hey, Maddie. How are we? Good. So those who've just joined, Maddie, um, if you can change your um, name, so you can click the little uh, blue option just up the top there, uh, just where it says sort of mute and... How can I say Peter Kanowski? Yeah. It's a I compliment, think. Maddie. <laughs> That's dangerous, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I think because you used the link that Peter sent, I also use it, so, and then it was Peter Kanowski too in my screen. <laughs> you are the you are the second duplication of Peter Kanowski. Yeah, one's more than enough. Hi, hi welcome. Yeah, hi all. Hi, nice hi, um, cool. Thanks to um, everyone who is joining us so far. We're just going to wait. Um, a few minutes for some more people to join the session to get it underway and then we'll we'll uh, start. This is Black Mountain this morning. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful, Maddie. Thanks to those attendees who are just uh, joining us. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes to get underway, wait for a few more people to join. Right, we've had a few people uh, join us now, so we might get underway. Uh, first, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. Just want to play a short video and then I'll hand over to Peter Kanowski, who'll be uh, moderating this session this afternoon. So if you want to make a real impact in the world and you want to develop skills that make you very employable, then you might want to think about studying environment issues. Environment issues are core to a lot of the important challenges around the world. Challenges in how, we've, in how we feed people, how we have sustainable cities, uh, how we manage bushfire, how we manage climate change and, and, and so on. And a really, uh, it's a great opportunity to study environment issues at the ANU because the ANU has the Fenner School of Environment and Society. And the Fenner School, we recognise that environment issues have got that uh, dimension to do with the plants and the animals and the trees and the soil and so on, but they always also have a human dimension, that's the society part. And we, we bring both of those elements to any, anything we 
we study. We have leading researchers in the school that are making a big difference in the world themselves, but also play a role in teaching the courses that we teach. So if you're really passionate about environment, we've got a degree just for you called the Bachelors in Environment and Sustainability. And that's a course that focuses in the Fenner School that has opportunities in other schools. But actually, you might be more interested in doing a Bachelor of Science or Arts, or you might want to study law or politics and still bring some environmental perspectives into one of those degrees. And this approach is possible too. It's really easy if you're doing a Bachelor of Science to choose plenty of environment subjects and mix them up with a few others. But even those other degrees have generally got the flexibility to bring in courses from other schools. And we love having these students in our environment courses too. Either of these options are great, and the ANU is a great place to be doing them. I hope you think about studying environment at the ANU. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to hand over to Peter now, and I'm just going to uh, mute myself. Thanks, Pete, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Fenner School in uh, ANU Open Week, and welcome to this forest and forest science uh, session. I'm Peter Konoski. I'm the Professor of Forestry uh, in the school. I have a number of colleagues here who I'll introduce in a moment, um, but let's acknowledge first the um, traditional owners of the countries on which we meet, uh, where I am, the Nunawal, Ngunnawal, and the Gambri and Narigu peoples and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, thanks for your interest in uh, forests. And um, this afternoon, there's a, a group of us who are involved with the forestry program um, as staff and students. who will tell you a bit about what we do uh, and then um, have time for uh, questions around uh, issues you'd like to raise with us. Um, so I hope you can see on the screen my colleague, Matt Brookhouse, um, who will tell you about his research uh, and teaching. Uh, Depi Suzawati, who's a PhD student. Depi's from Indonesia, uh, and uh, she's um, uh, coming close to ending her PhD, can tell you about that work. Maddie Shelton, um, who is a master's student in the second year of her master's degree. Uh, she's uh, um, uh, sitting in front of where she was this morning at Black Mountain on a frosty Canberra morning. Adam McLaughlin, who uh, besides being an undergraduate student in the school is also responsible for managing uh, fires in uh, Cotta Catchment and I uh, want to welcome him. And uh, Emma and Oliver, Oliver's got uh, my name against him, but it's actually Oliver, um, who are undergraduate students and representatives of the International Forestry Students Association. So uh, want to welcome them all. Um, and you'll hear from uh, uh, all of those people, um, or at least one of Oliver and Emma, uh, at the uh, as as we go through. So I've got a few slides to share to begin. Let me just bring those up, um, and uh, just give you a little bit of background uh, based on those. And I hope you can see um, uh, a picture here of uh, Christopher Green, who's a custodian of traditional country up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, burning his country, managing the landscape, caring for country. And uh, for me, this picture epitomizes much of uh, the character of uh, forest and forest management in Australia. We've got a unique landscape in Australia, um, uniquely shaped by 60,000 years of Aboriginal people's settlement and management of Australia. Uh, and working with Aboriginal people uh, to manage their country is one of the um, great opportunities that we working in forests have. We've got some great challenges as well. Um, uh, this is a picture uh, that Adam's probably only too familiar with and some of you, others of you who live uh, in or around Canberra would be as well. The um, summer bushfires that were uh, so severe across much of southeastern Australia uh, one of the big challenges for Australia, as Saul mentioned in his introductory remarks there, uh, how we manage bushfires in a climate that's becoming warmer and drier, and we've got a bit of a taste of that uh, this summer. So that's a big challenge for us as well. In the school, uh, those of us who work on forests um, work globally as well as locally, 
And so there's a picture here from WWF's Living Forest Report that uh, just situates um, how uh, we think about forests in the Australian context in the broader global picture. And um, without going into the detail, there's plenty there, but uh, uh, forests are, um, as I'm sure you're all uh, aware, one of the fundamentally important terrestrial ecosystems uh, supporting life on Earth through uh, delivering a whole range of ecosystem services and products, as well as products that we use. And uh, in this era of the Anthropocene that we're moving into, uh, one of climate change and the scale of human impact on the environment, uh, we face new challenges in, in managing our forests, not just the challenges of fire uh, that we um, experienced over the summer, but a whole range of other challenges as we adapt uh, to a changing environment. And in Australia, of course, we're very fortunate. We've got globally unique, wonderful native forests and biodiversity that depend on them. Um, we've got trees, um, the picture that you see there um, uh, in uh, central western New South Wales, um, near the ANU Siding Springs Observatory, trees that provide uh, fodder for livestock in, in the drought. We've got uh, extraordinary native forested landscapes that are both a delight and a challenge to, to manage. We also have uh, lots of pl plantation forests, trees that have been planted deliberately, mostly to produce wood, but perhaps for other purposes as well. Uh, here's a picture of some of our students on a field trip uh, over near Tumut on a nice sunny winter's day. Um, and we've got a, in Australia quite a significant forest industry based on, on those um, uh, resources. And that's another arena that our graduates uh, engage with and work in. And globally, we've got a lot of development around the bioeconomy. This is a picture from Finland, uh, where one of the large forestry companies in Finland is now uh, making diesel fuel from trees. So, uh, the bioeconomy in the way that it's being developed uh, in Europe and North America hasn't really arrived in Australia yet, but it's going to be a very important component of how we respond to the challenges of climate change. We and our students work a lot with farmers um, and we work in the region. So here's a couple of pictures from Indonesia. Uh, Depi, who you've just seen in real life, here she is doing her PhD field work in the wilds of Kalimantan. Um, on the left hand side of the picture is a Javanese farmer growing uh, trees as part of uh, his family's livelihood and in the middle a group of uh, a family uh, in Papua New Guinea who I was working with helping them uh, capitalize on the benefits of trees for their livelihoods. So we work um, in our native forests in Australia, we work in our plantation forests and we work with farmers um, and we work on a range of issues in the region. And we do that from a base in Canberra. And as all of us who are in Canberra know, it's just a wonderful place to live because it's the bush capital. It's a great place to endure a COVID pandemic because we've got so much green space. And it's also a natural research facility for us and for our students. So we do a lot of work in the urban environment in Canberra as well. And just to uh, finish off uh, the slides that um, uh, we have uh, as background, you're probably aware we've got uh, programs at the undergraduate grad and uh, graduate level, um, besides the environment and sustainability degree um, that has a forest minor. You can also do that minor um, from uh, a science degree or another ANU degree. We've got a master of forestry and a PhD program. We've got a great mix of international and Australian students in each of those programs. So that's a little bit of background um, to what we do. And I'm going to uh, finish sharing my slides and uh, invite um, my colleague, Matt Brookhouse, to tell you a little bit about the work that he does. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I'll share a screen, my screen with you as well now. Um, and start with this image. Um, while it's a 
confronting image to start with, it's it's a very important image to start with because at the moment it, it very much captures the kind of work that I'm very much involved in. Before I start talking about that work, it's important, I think, to remember that forests, like other ecosystems, are complex um, structures. They include interactions or are made up of interactions between trees, obviously, but, but also interactions between uh, the overstory, the trees, the understory, the shrubs underneath, but also all of the, the fauna, the invertebrate fauna, the insects, as well as the vertebrate fauna that, that make up the ecosystem. But of course, it's also an interaction, a product of the relationship between living things and the environment itself. And while that is very much part of the way that forests function, we also see at times what we might describe as a dysfunction in the way that forests um, are developing and responding uh, to stimuli around them. Now, one way of looking at forests at the moment is through the lens of dieback, and that is the decline and, and death of trees and stands. And that's an issue that globally has re-emerged um, after in the 1980s, a lot of researchers around the world were concerned about dieback in forests internationally. Uh, the issue of dieback has re-emerged as a major concern uh, for forests around the world. And in Australia, we are by no means exempt from that concern. And what you can see here in front of you is a photograph of a forest very near here to the ACT. Uh, in the ACT, as Peter mentioned, the area that we conduct our research and our teaching is very much a, a natural teaching and research environment. And this forest that you're looking at is the forest in the Brindabella Range. It's made up of one of our high elevation eucalypt species, snow gum. And what you can see there is something that we describe as dieback of high elevation snow gum forest. And to give you a, a sense of the scale of that, at least as we can see it here from Canberra. And I've indicated in this photograph, um, the position of the ANU in the background. If you're not from Canberra, you wouldn't recognize Black Mountain, but it's sitting there in the background. And really this is the landscape that shaped me both as a forest researcher and, and generally as a person. I grew up in Canberra and the Brindabella Range was a backdrop for me as I grew up. And now, with the, from this perspective, we can see that um, forest dieback is affecting a substantial area of the high elevation forests uh, around Canberra. Now, it's not restricted to only Canberra and the Brindabella Range, but it is much more widespread and present throughout uh, the Australian Alps, so in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. And it appears to be spreading quickly. Now, what we know of it is that it's a product of this insect feeding on trees and leaving that damage that you can see on the right hand side. But consistent with what I was, my, my opening comments about the complexity of forests, it's useful to bear in mind that the insect and what it does to trees is really the final expression of a complex set of processes that really defines forests, that interaction between not only the trees themselves, but the interaction with insects and vertebrate fauna, but also the impacts of climate and also site conditions. An important element for us to remember though, is that when we see things like this in the landscape, forest dying back, it's not necessarily a product of dysfunction, but rather it's important for us to remember that as complex entities Forests go through phases of regeneration, of birth and life and death. And, and this is, in many instances, a natural consequence of stand structural development. So it's a product of forest developing over time. So when we come to these complex questions around issues like dieback, we need to come to those questions with a very open mind and fully aware of the complexity of the ecosystems that we're dealing with. And they take in things like an understanding of the way that forests develop over time, 
the way that they respond to environmental extremes, trends in climate, extreme drought phenomena, fire, and on the far right, you can see an image there of, of trees in a very different, much more open landscape. We need to ask questions about what role major disturbances like fire play in shaping uh, processes like dieback. Now, one way, and this is an important way for me, and this really captures uh, the research that, that I hold very much dear to the work that I do. One way that we can ask questions and, and indeed answer questions that we have about the complex processes of forest dieback is to begin not asking why, but asking where and when forest dieback events take place. And a way that we can do that, of course, we can go out there and map it, but once the forest is dead, it's too late for us to come and map. All we want to understand is how the process developed, where it developed, and when exactly it developed, and what the conditions were like beforehand. And this image on the right-hand side is an indication of the way that we go about that, or at least the way I go about it, and that's using tree rings. You can see a wonderful piece of wood there with some very clear indicators of past growth, and we can make use of that past growth to reconstruct disturbance events like dieback. And that's a central part of the research that I'm doing right now, entering into these landscapes and reconstructing past forest events and trying to pull apart the complex relationships between trees, between forests, between trees and the insects and the impacts that climate has. Of course, that's not the only thing we do with tree rings. Here's an example of some wonderful and very exciting work that I did on a portrait of Henry VIII, in which we could not only date when the portrait was uh, put together, but also where the timber came from, which is a very, very important part of art conservation work. Of course, I'm not just here conducting research. I bring my research very much into my teaching, and my teaching is, uh, is made up of, of now two undergraduate courses, in first year, I'm involved in, um, in helping students developing skills in asking research questions and also the very difficult and complex at times terrain of statistics as well. But in second year, a really key thing that I've become involved in is, is uh, teaching and encouraging students along a pathway towards developing skills in field measurement and conduct of, of field studies. And my teaching in those frames is informed by my experience in a, in a professional setting. I've worked in forest industry, uh, but also ongoing research that I have. So I try to bring that into my teaching. And that's certainly something that you'll find at the ANU. So just a quick summary there of the kind of research that I'm involved in, not just forest dieback, but a range of topics involving elevated CO2, the relationship between hydrology and bushfires, as well, of course, this forest dieback and forest history component. Happy to be contacted by you as well. There's my email address at the bottom, matthew.brookhouse at anu.edu.au. So if you have questions about dieback or forest in general, I'm always happy to answer you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much, Matt, for a good introduction to much of the diversity of work that you and others are engaged in. Um, Let's just work our way around the room very briefly. Um, uh, Deppy is sitting in the ANU Wood Library, which is a wonderful place to be. So Deppy, welcome and over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Deppy Susilawati. I come from Indonesia and I'm now doing a PhD at the Fenner School and Peter Kanowski is my supervisor. Uh, my research is about forest policy and governance, particularly uh, seeing how timber legality verification system is being implemented in Indonesian market change, started from the forest to the wood processor to the trader to, the make, to make sure the legality of wood and also the sustainability uh, forest management. Uh, as an international student, uh, studying forestry science for me at ANU has broadening my knowledge and also improving my academic skill. So I learned uh, start from how to prepare my research proposal, 
also conducting research at the field. I did my research uh, at three main islands in Indonesia, including Borneo, the previous picture that Peter saw. So I was in the wild and then uh, struggling with the very rapid stream uh, to get to the forest. Uh, also, I learned how to analyze data, to writing the result into international publications. So, so far I met uh, two publications and now my third one is merely to submission. And also I learned how to present my research uh, at the international conference or national conference. I went to Netherlands to present my research and also uh, some national conference here in ANU. Uh, and also I involve as a, uh, and learn how to, to, to do the teaching assistant. So I, I, I'm a tutor at Peter class, previously also at Metcalf class. Uh, it was a lot of fun and uh, so much uh, knowledge and skill that I, 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 I gained during this uh, experience. So during my PhD program, I also learned how forest science work at the international level. Uh, the forest science has important role in shaping international forest governance. Uh, so we know uh, about the concept of sustainable forest management. So it's not only about how to harvest wood, but also how to manage the forest in a sustainable way. We have to still maintain the biodiversity, also concern about the local community, and even about the uh, heritage value as you can see here the wood library is a proof as uh, the connection between wood science and heritage value in the past i believe this is built in 1927 following the establishment of australian forestry school in canberra and also has a significant connection with canberra uh, built heritage uh, we, we also learn about other international initiatives such as uh, red plus uh, reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation, uh, flag the initiative including the timber legality verification system that I researched uh, back home in, my in, in Indonesia. Uh, then other, uh, a lot of international initiatives try to address uh, all the challenge in forestry sector and also climate change. Uh, at the international level, uh, the forest science can offer uh, use several uh, pathway of career, uh, such as in uh, C4. So C4 is Center for International Forestry Research, best uh, actually in my country and in my hometown in Bogor. Uh, there are also other opportunity for forestry uh, science at the international organization, such as UN Forum for Forest, uh, FAO Forestry, or IPTO, the International Tropical Timber Organization or IUFRO, International Union of Forest Research Organization, and so on. And there are also plenty of international NGO working in forestry sector, uh, also promoting uh, sustainable forest management. And also private industry that uh, later on, my college Medi will explain more about it. Uh, you can also work there uh, for the one who support for legal wood and sustainable forest management. I think that's all for now from me. So thank you, Peter, and happy to answer any question later on. Thanks very much, Debbie. Thanks for bringing both a PhD perspective and an international perspective, because one of the great things about ANU and the Fenner School is that we've got a very international community um, to uh, be part of. So thank you for representing that. Um, let me come to Maddie, because uh, Maddie's a master's student um, and uh, working in Australia. So. Um, a different degree program and a different uh, background from that that Debbie's talked about. Thanks, Maddie. Hello, I'm Maddie. I, I got into forestry in a kind of roundabout way. I started my undergraduate in political science and then ended up in international trade and exports. And when I got a job in, offered a job doing forestry exports after wine and cheese and, and the like, then I, I was originally a bit hesitant to take the job because I, I didn't think much of forestry at that point, to be honest. But then I got into it and I just loved it and I adored it and I like being in the forest and I started seeing the whole supply chain and how it all works. and. I decided to make a career move from, 
from the business world to studying forestry and looking at the more complicated things that are involved in it. And that is what happened when I came to ANU. So I've learned about water science. I've learned about sustainable agriculture since I've been here. I've also learned a lot about all the other forestry students, PhDs and masters and what they're studying. So I've got a really good, you know, widespread knowledge of like all the facets involved with forestry. And yeah, I think it's a great course and a great environment to be involved in, great professors to be under. Peter, I haven't met Matt yet, but I'm sure I will. And yeah, I'd really recommend it if you're interested in forests. Thanks, Maddie, as you very clearly are sitting in front of that wonderful picture. So mm. th thanks very much. Um, let me come to Adam. Um, uh, so Adam's uh, uh, an undergraduate student working in forests, um, both professionally and also in his studies. Adam, I've lost you from the screen. Are you there? Uh, I hope you can hear me. I think my video might have frozen. Um, we can hear you well. That's fine. That's great. Uh, you don't need to see me anyway. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Adam. I am uh, an employee of the ACT Parks and Conservation Service. Um, I'm also an undergraduate student. Um, I'm enrolled in a number of science, which um, I've taken a lot of um, sort of environment and society-based courses. Um, professionally, the fire management officer for the local catchment, um, which has me responsible for managing the bushfire hazards. Within, Adam, um, Peter, Peter here, sorry to interrupt. I think maybe you turn your video off because it's uh, we're losing you with the video. Okay, sure, now. no yeah. problem. So um, I'm responsible for managing the bushfire risks to the lower cotter catchment, um, which is uh, part of the reason that Canberra is located where it is in that the cotter catchment includes the water supply for the ACT and the forests are an integral part of that catchment in that they s provide for um, maintenance of water quality and water quantity in in Canberra and really support the functioning of our city. So um, studying at ANU, I've both been able to really apply the lessons learned practically in my work, uh, as well as to contribute to the learning experience through Fenner, um, Fenner School courses. And um, yeah, look, I, I really enjoy um, both studying and working in forests, um, you know, looking at the range of environmental services they provide to, um, well, society, but as well um, the biodiversity, the rich biodiversity of our planet um, is really supported by forested landscapes. So um, that's, that's what I sort of connect um, pr both professionally um, and also academically from, from forests and, you know, I would encourage anyone to, um, you know, spend some time considering how much uh, forest courses and, and forest sciences can contribute to a well-rounded uh, professional and academic life. Thanks. Thanks very much, Adam. And you're the epitome of that. So thanks for speaking to that point. Uh, Ollie and Emma, I think one of you is going to talk. Ollie, is that you or Emma? Yeah, I'm happy to talk. Um, okay, thanks, Ollie. Welcome. Another of our undergraduate students and he and Emma are both engaged in the International Forestry Students Association, amongst other things. So thanks very much, Ollie, for joining us and Emma too. Hi. So, yeah, I'm with the International Forestry Students Association or IFSA. Um, I'm the, the student engagement officer and Emma is one of our, our co-presidents. Um, and we're a sort of an industry student uh, interaction body where uh, students can get involved with industry um, and we do this through a variety of, of um, ways we last year we had a careers night this year we're also having a careers night but online uh, we do field trips um, and because we're international we have the opportunity to go all over the world we uh, last year we had trips to New Zealand and Latvia um, and this year we had planned to go to Taiwan and Canada but um, unfortunately that 
was not able to happen. Um, but yeah, that's really it. Um, we're a, a student body, an international student body that that interacts with industry and other other students. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Ollie, and thanks Emma too for being here. Um, that's the end of uh, what we had to say by way of introduction. So uh, the floor is open, as open as it can be in a Zoom meeting. Um, for uh, those of you who are joining us to uh, flag any questions that you'd like us to respond to, to ask uh, anything you'd like to um, learn about studying uh, forests and forest science or indeed anything else that you're interested in uh, at ANU and we'll do our, our best to respond. Um, you can either type a message into the chat uh, or you can, I think, raise your hand. Pete, uh, there's a ha raise handing mechanism for attendees. Um, yes. Yep, yeah, that's there as well. Uh, and uh, let us know that you'd like to speak. We'd be very happy to hear from you. Usually we do this in person at open day. So this is a bit of an experiment for us as well. I might, I might just ask one question just to kick it off. Um, so looking at some of the different courses, whether you're looking at undergraduate or some of the uh, postgrad ones, what, what take into account um, some of these subjects? Sorry, Pete, the last bit again. So um, if you're looking at um, some of these um, undergraduate courses and uh, postgrad courses, what are some of the subjects which will look at forestry and what would some of those um, teaching and learning and experiences be like? Maybe, you know, talk about field trips, that sort of thing as well. Perhaps we'll start with Matt, um, uh, because that first year course is an entry point for many uh, undergraduates, Matt. We might ask um, Adam to say something about the Managing Forest and Landscape course that, that he's done. And perhaps Emma, you might like to talk about something that, that you do um, um, in relation to, to your studies. That might be a, a sort of way of picking up some of those points. You're on mute, Matt. Thank you. Um, the, the first year course that I teach, thank you, Peter, that is, um, that is really uh, a course that offers students a number of uh, things in their first year and it is now in first semester of first year reflecting the, one of the important uh, elements that students really need to, um, and not just students who are interested in, in forests, but students in, interested in environment more broadly, need to take on board very early on. And, and that is not necessarily um, an understanding of first year statistics, but a way to start asking questions of the things that we see around us, how to make observations and how to turn those observations into questions. Now, the context within which we nest that teaching is within the local environment that Peter mentioned at the start there. Um, and Maddie's photograph indicates as well, we work on, on Black Mountain and we start asking questions about um, attributes of forests on Black Mountains. Now, many people are familiar with the ideas that um, forest species compositions and forest structures reflect environmental conditions, but those conditions can change quite dramatically from one side of a ridgeline to the other. And our teaching in first year, in that first semester course in first year, uses that setting within a forest to start developing research, writing and questioning skills within first year students and also provide that introduction to forest in the first instance. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Adam, you mentioned when you spoke about the connection between your professional work and the, the courses you were studying. I just wonder whether you'd like to say a bit more about that from, from your, your perspective. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'd, I'd like to, I think, yeah, draw a connection um, between really the, the wonderful labor laboratory, which is Canberra and the setting of ANU in that um, it is a city both in an urban forest but also with great connections to a range of natural spaces and that most of the courses I've taken at ANU have involved field work which gets you off campus um, in very quick succession 
and you can visit a range of different landscapes to sort of really apply your learning and, and field science um, with your education. So with a 20 minute drive, you can be in you know, one of our water catchments, which is a forested landscape, or for a five minute walk, you can be on Black Mountain and looking at uh, how the landscape responds to topography and the microclimate. Um, so, you know, ANU provides just such a great setting for this type of educational experience. Um, for me personally, um, in Peter's course, so man managing forested landscapes, we undertook a range of field trips um, associated with the teaching, and that included visiting the Lower Cotter catchment, which for me is an area I have some responsibility for the management of. So as a student, but also as, as a professional, I was able to contribute to um, that field trip in what was an, an interesting fashion, but really able to um, assist in the learning of the other students in understanding some of the history of that landscape and some of the current practices and management challenges which um, which the future holds for it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just a great sort of both school and educational opportunity, but also a great learning landscape in, in Canberra and in the ACT. Thanks, Adam. It sure is. Um, Emma, something you'd like to say about some of the courses you've been doing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, just, I mean, not, not to just repeat what everyone has said, but one of the great things about ANU and the environment courses um, that they offer is that for most of them, you really do get to get out onto the field. And I think when you're learning about the environment, it can be really easy to lose the connection between what you're learning and the assignments and whatnot. And so I think ANU really facilitates getting out on the field, seeing um, firsthand what you're learning about. And as Matthew said, it's not necessarily all forestry related. Um, there are heaps of interesting things that we learn about, but even with IFSA, which both Ollie and I are part of, it's great to then hone in on like a specific area that you're interested in to do with the environment, such as forestry, um, which the ANU deals with so well, especially with the surrounding environment, um, such as Black Mountain. Um, it's, it offers, there are so many opportunities at the ANU to learn broadly about the environment, but then also go more specific with things like forestry. Um, and then they are really supportive of student groups such as IFSA um, and have always backed us with our events and field trips. Um, so it's been great. Thanks, Emma. It's great to hear that. Um, let me just pause and see if there are any questions from the floor, either um, in the chat or just um, by waving your hand so that Pete can uh, see that you'd like to ask a question. I don't think there's anything else yet. One thing that is often on students' minds, though, is about, you know, the kind of careers um, which you can do after study. And I think with um, all environmental science subjects, they're a lot broader than what you might initially um, imagine in your mind. I um, wonder I mean, if a few people would be able to speak to that. Sure. Why don't I begin um, with a few um, starting points and then um, also uh, just invite um, perhaps beginning with Maddie um, from her experience and uh, coming to Matt and, uh, and Depi. Um, I think uh, if, if you look at where our graduates find work, um, they choose to find work in a whole range of uh, organisations in, in government, in the private sector, uh, with environmental NGOs, with community organisations. Um, I showed when I started a picture of an Aboriginal landowner, uh, custodian, burning country. Uh, quite a few of our graduates work with um, Aboriginal communities and with uh, the organisations and work with them because the management of country is so important um, to their uh, community. Um, as you've heard Emma just say, something that attracts 
many students to study environment and forests as the opportunity to work um, uh, outdoors at least some of the time and people like Adam had that opportunity on a daily basis. Uh, people like me who used to do that, um, you can see I'm in, in my office at the moment and um, most of my time spent um, uh, working indoors uh, thinking I guess rather than working outdoors thinking but Matt um, can tell you about some of the work he already talked a bit about some of the work he does outdoors. Um, and as Depi uh, flagged, many of our graduates also interested in working internationally. Um, a little bit difficult at the moment because they can't get there. Um, but uh, the school has field courses in Vietnam and Fiji. Um, many of the graduate students that I work with work in the region as part of their studies. And many of them go on to continue working in, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, but also more broadly. So um, I think that from my perspective, um, the, the breadth of opportunity uh, in forests and forestry globally um, are, really, uh, are really astonishing. And um, uh, I think that's good to have that in your mind as well when you're thinking about where studying forests and forestry might take you. Matt, would you like to comment a little bit? And then I'll just come to, to Maddie and Depi um, before we come back to some other questions. Uh, sure. Um, of course, I mentioned a little earlier that I have a professional background prior to uh, returning here uh, to take up to start studying again. And that professional background was in a commercial forestry sense. Um, and that, um, in, in my degree, that was, that was um, a major turning point for, for me and, and gave me a great deal of experience that then fed forward. But, now in my research, um, in a research context, I come into contact with former students from the ANU, students who have studied uh, forest science and environmental science generally. Um, I come into contact with those students on a daily basis, both in, in direct land management roles in, in national parks and land management settings like those in which Adam works. But, uh, but also on a daily basis, as Peter mentioned, students working in government settings. But, but to think that um, we can constrain um, employment um, for students in environmental studies and forest related studies to, to those, kind of, um, those kind of definitions of, of um, direct environmental roles is perhaps a bit too narrow. We can, um, the emergence of um, the environment and, and environmental custodianship and responsibility within business broadly worldwide means that um, a perspective on environment, environmental management, environmental responsibility is a, is a component of many, especially larger businesses, um, many businesses focus now. So a, a grounding and a background in, in forest and environment is a, is a key component in, in many business settings. Thanks, Matt. Maddie, could you say something a little bit about private sector work from your experience? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I was an exporter and I worked with many people across the entire supply chain from the shipping vessel brokers to the farmers that supplied the forest products or the plantation or the commercial companies. And there's definitely a lot of opportunities, at least like I worked in Tasmania, New South Wales, uh, Western Australia, and yeah, and a bit in Victoria. And there's all sorts of types of people. There's FPOs, like forest practices officers in, in Tasmania, people who do the certifications for the, um, for the harvest of the products and there's also silver culture professionals and managers who help you manage forests, which you can actually do for other people like me who've bought a plantation but don't actually manage it because I'm not in the state. There's also a whole range of positions that were in the larger commercial companies and then also the people that just did it for themselves, also people with property and who wanted to plant trees and plantations and, you know, just put in an asset that was intergenerational or, 
or just something to do with spare land. And so it's, it's really broad. And if learning about forestry and forest systems kind of gives you an opportunity to go into whichever way of those sectors, whether it's something I've mentioned or it's something completely different, but it's really your options are pretty big and there's always going to be a spot for people that know quite a bit about how forests work. Thanks, Maddie. And uh, that's a good segue to a question that uh, Maya, perhaps, I'm not sure if I pronounced your name right, Maya, uh, asked in the chat that I've responded to around um, the topic of social forestry and how um, do students engage with that. And uh, uh, as I've said in the chat, um, amongst one of the strengths of our school is that we've got a very diverse group of academics um, from uh, people like Matt who are working uh, focused on the ecology, uh, people like me who are working more on policy and governance, to colleagues who work um, in uh, measuring forests and in urban forests. So we've got um, uh, a range of courses uh, that um, address both the social sciences foundations of social forestry, but also address some of the more uh, technical elements of it. Uh, and um, also, as I said in the chat, and as we've just been, been discussing around careers, um, many of us are working uh, on projects that you know, might be in, in the ACT with colleagues here, um, in the urban or the um, uh, forested catchment areas of the ACT. Uh, others like Matt are working in other parts of Australia with partners there, and uh, others like me, are working internationally. I work a lot in Laos and uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. Uh, and all of that project work uh, gives us an opportunity to involve students, um, just as the work of our other colleagues in the Fenner School does as well. So I think that there are those sort of opportunities, um, particularly or specifically in relation to um, social forestry. That's your question, Maya. But also um, in relation to other topics that you might be interested in. Um, uh, Ollie or, or uh, Emma, I wondered um, before we perhaps come to a few other points, is there anything else you'd like to say from the sort of uh, student um, organisation or IFSA point of view about the sorts of things that IFSA does internationally? You, you spoke a little bit, Ollie, about, about that, but perhaps a couple of practical examples of the sort of things that happen might be, might be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So we do a whole bunch of events, uh, both regional and international. Um, and they last year, I think a few of us went to New Zealand to do, do you know what, what we did last year? I've forgotten, Emma. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, so our, one of our colleagues, Paris, um, went to New Zealand last year for um, like a conference regarding forestry specifically. And another one of our students went to Estonia and I went to Madrid for um, the, the, UNM, the UNFCCC COP25 um, climate convention that was originally meant to be in Chile um, as a delegate with international IFSA um, and that was all just from last year and as Oli touched on um, just before we were meant to be going to a couple of different places this year as well um, but then obviously COVID happened. Um, so there are a bunch, and so and that's only possible because obviously IFSA is um, a local committee of the ANU. Um, so it's not a course or anything offered by the ANU, but it's a student association that exists um, within the ANU. Um, so there are so many um, international opportunities, as was made evident with like these different international things that um, IFSA does to work within forestry. Um, and the environment. Um, and they're all really great experiences. I had a great time and I know that um, Paris and Julia did as well in Estonia and New Zealand. Yep, they did. So I guess that's another dimension to the international experience. Thanks for um, flagging that, Emma and Ollie, is that uh, as a student, you can engage with IFSA and organisations like that. And that gives you networks internationally that you can then capitalise on uh, professionally later. Um, uh, so uh, again, that sort of global context for the work we do is really uh, valuable for us. 
Um, I'm looking at the clock and thinking that we're going to run out of time soon. So I'm going to run around the room in a moment and ask the panelists just to make um, one closing remark before the um, hour is up. And that closing remark is a simple question in what do you enjoy most about the work you do in forests? Um, and uh, Deppy, I didn't give you a chance to speak in the last round, so let me begin with you. What do you enjoy most besides writing papers for publication? <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I, I do enjoy most, especially when I be in the forest. Uh, being in the middle of the forest just remind me of how uh, you need to balance your life. Like you don't think one side only, for example, only on animal welfare, but we also need to think about people living in the forest. We don't only think about the, how to harvest the tree, we need to think how to plant the tree. So that's really, uh, yeah, inspired me to be also balanced in my life too. That's a great message, Jeffy. Thanks. Matt, how about you? Uh, I remember when I was in first year, one of my first year lecturers um, telling me that there was never a time when he travelled out to the forest that he didn't learn something. And, and for me, that's, that's true every time I go out to forest. Even when I walk to ANU from my home on the other side of Black Mountain, uh, there isn't a, a trip to the forest that doesn't involve learning. And, and that's a wonderful thing to enjoy. Thanks, Matt. You must have been a great student back then. <laughs> I got better. <laughs> Matt, Maddie, how about you? What I'm going to double up on both Deppy and Matt. I, I, it's nice to see the whole entire chain and process from planting to harvesting to conserving and then also just being out in the forest because, let's face it, they take a long time to grow. So there's a lot of time you spend just being there and it's, it's, it's a nice place to be. It's a nice office. Thanks. It is a wonderful office, Matty. That's right. Adam? Yeah, I, as, a, as a firefighter and as a, a forest manager, I've seen forests, I guess, um, at their best and at their worst. Um, and even when you're in a forest and it's on fire, it's always amazing to see the breadth of life um, which exists there. And when you're in a forest, when it's not on fire, just that feeling of being in the lungs of the earth um, is an amazing feeling. Yeah, thanks. Uh, even when you're fighting fire, that's impressive. Ollie, how about you? Um, I am just, I enjoy being outside. I enjoy being outside with other people and being outside with experts and fellow students and industry members and seeing all the different perspectives that uh, those different parties have and bring them all together with uh, forestry at ANU is just a really interesting experience. Yeah, thanks. Um, Emma? Yeah, I actually really agree with what Ollie just said. I think it like, yeah, I, I actually don't really have anything to add to that. I think just being outside, um, I think forests are such a big part of just the environment in general, especially for Australia um, and the issues with bushfires um, and management in general and there's just I don't know I think that it, it there's a bit of a stigma around it where it's a bit boring and it's just trees and logging but there's there's so much to know about it and it's really interesting yeah well I hope that we've all given that impression um, in what we've uh, talked about this afternoon because I think for all of us um, uh, as Matt observed there's so much um, interesting in the environment and um, so many ways to engage with it and uh, I think that for me, that's also a motivating factor. And the other motivating factor for me is the wonderful people that you get to work with. I think that we uh, staff and students in Fanner feel we're really fortunate that we've got such a great group of colleagues and of students, uh, undergraduate and graduate level uh, to work with. Um, and, you know, we'd encourage you to be part of that and, and share that experience. Um, uh, Maya has uh, asked a question about biosecurity. I might just respond to that while I'm speaking, uh, Maya. Um, uh, we have some colleagues who work uh, in biosecurity, um, mostly though in conjunction with um, colleagues in CSIRO or uh, in the federal government. Um, we don't have a strong biosecurity program in its own right. We've got people like our school director um, who work on elements that relate to that. 
and some other colleagues who've done work um, uh, in conjunction with um, researchers outside ANU around particular biosecurity issues. Um, so uh, it's not a it's not a um, a theme within uh, the work that we do, but we do have research students who are interested in aspects of biosecurity who who work on that. Um, and that's probably a general answer to um, a range of similar questions as well. Um, if you look on our website and look at what uh, staff and students do, you'll get a pretty good idea of the sort of key themes that we work on in the school. Um, but many of us have got um, broad interests and our graduate students certainly have broad interests. So if you're interested in anything to do with forests, um, drop us a line through the contacts that Pete's been posting into the uh, web page. What's the best way to reach us officially, Pete? Uh, probably at um, fenneschool at anu.edu.au, which I'll just uh, type out that now. Okay. Uh, but on our website, we do have all the contact details and lots of um, our individual academics have their emails up there as well and are usually very willing to, to answer any questions, um, particularly if, if you're looking at um, post-grad stuff as well. So yeah, we do encourage you to reach out. Yeah, so you can find Matt's address there, as he mentioned before, my address is there. You'll find Deppie's address there too, because he's a PhD scholar. Um, you may not find Maddie or Emma or Ollie um, or Adam, but if you want to reach them, we can forward your message on. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're up uh, against time. Um, happy to follow up um, with any further questions through email, as Pete's just posted into the chat. Pete, is there anything else we need to say uh, to our participants before we wrap up? Um, no, just thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be putting this record um, as a recording up online on our website, so you can rewatch that or share it with people if you like next week. Um, and we've got a few more sessions for a new open week as well. So do check our website as well as uh, the list to the, there's a playlist um, I put up of, of some videos talking about field trip and research. So um, that's of uh, interest as well. Um, but, you know, thanks for joining us and thanks to all our panellists. Okay, and I think the panellists will do a collective wave and say thank you and we hope to see you in person uh, at ANU uh, next year or whenever it is that you're thinking about joining us. Um, and can I thank all of the panellists for making time um, to share their experiences. Um, it's always so positive to hear about them. Okay, we'll end there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao.